This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. Every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. And I will make room for you to do whatever you want to. To do whatever you want to. And I will make room for you to do whatever you want to. To do whatever you want to.
sing this last part out. Here is where I lay it down. You are all I'm chasing now. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. You are all I'm chasing now. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. BBCC's Ministry to Men and Women are in the midst of an exciting new year of connection and spiritual growth. The ladies are in an eye-opening series entitled, When God Doesn't Fix It with Laura's Story. And the men continue a life-changing study on authentic manhood called 33 The Series. Both ministries happen every Thursday with two opportunities for women at 10 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. in the Life Center Gym. And our ministry to men happens at 6.30 p.m. every Thursday in the Family Center. Are you a mom seeking connection, encouragement, and empowerment in this crazy task of motherhood? Moms Connected is an evening group for moms of all ages and stages. We have a place for you to fellowship and grow because we get what it means to be a mom. Meetings are on the second and fourth Mondays of the month in the family room from 7 to 8.15 p.m. For more information and a full schedule, go to bonitavalley.com slash momsconnected. Collage invites all 20-somethings and college-age students to our first event of 2021, happening Friday, January 15th from 7 to 9 p.m. in the Family Center. There will be free food, catching up with friends, and a special teaching by Pastor Jordan entitled, Who's Your Hero? Collage meets the second and fourth Fridays of the month. Stay up to date with events and opportunities by following us on Instagram at collagebvcc. Bonita Valley doesn't just have opportunities to get spiritually fit, but physically fit too. And that's where Active Faith and Fitness comes in. Every week, fun opportunities are available for those who want to connect and take their health to the next level. On Mondays, we host a really fun Zumba experience at 5.45 p.m. And then we have open volleyball at 7 p.m., both in the Life Center gym. On Saturdays, we host boot camp and a 5K run walk. Both meet on the church lawn at 8 a.m. For more information on active faith and fitness and other opportunities, stop by BonitaValley.com. The COVID-19 quarantine may have changed some things we do, but it hasn't changed who we are. Bonita Valley is still a connected community, even if we're doing it from a distance by phone, on Zoom, or from behind a mask. We're still a caring community, helping and encouraging each other in creative new ways and we're still a generous community. Your financial faithfulness continues to make ministry happen even in these uncertain times, and we couldn't do it without you. Remember, you can give online at bonitavalley.com slash giving, by texting Bonita Valley to 77977, or by making your gift to BBCC at 4744 Bonita Road, Bonita, California, 91902. So how many of you have heard the story of the epic race between the turtle and the rabbit. Like that, that story dates back to ancient Greece. It was one of Aesop's fables. Now, I first heard of Aesop and his famous stories. Usually they were animal stories that get taught like human lessons. I first heard of, of Aesop, I first heard his stories, I first heard about his son when I was just really young. I mean, I was just a young, young kid. And I heard about them when I watched the adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle. Like some of you have no idea, but that was a very educational cartoon. In fact, just watch the screens. remember the tortoise had been goaded into a race with the hare and it wasn't long before the hare had left the tortoise so far behind that he decided he could well afford to kill a little time. I think I'll take in a movie. 
The picture was so good, from here to eternity, starring Rabbit Montgomery, that he sat through it twice, which proved to be a fatal mistake. The tortoise wins! Though you are a tortoise, if you are steady and watch out for rolling stones, you will come forth first. All right, that is a blast from my past. Some of you, you got no clue, but some of you are old enough like me. And, and I saw that cartoon, and, and I had no idea that Aesop had a son, which anyway, I'm not sure he did. But actually, the animators, they took a little poetic license with Aesop's original story of the tortoise and the hare. The, the, actual, the, the, the rabbit didn't go to a movie because they didn't exist yet, but the rabbit did get so far ahead that it took a nap. And while it's napping, the slow and steady turtle quietly went by and crossed the finish line first. And the moral of the story, it's a fairly short story, but the moral of the story is slow and steady wins the race. And that's not just true for turtles racing rabbits. It's true for you and me in the race of life and in going after the big dream that God has for us. In fact, we talked about it last time. God gave Israel a big dream of a promised land and a promised life. And then he told them that you will experience it a little at a time, little by little. One of the reasons why is because there's no way you and I can take hold of the big dream God has for us in one step, at one time. It's too big for that. The big dream God has for us, the big life God has for us, is bigger than any single moment. The Bible actually calls it a race. It's, and it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. It's an amazing call God has for us to, to be in the race to experience his biggest and best for our life. And so God tells Israel, you're going to experience it little by little. He actually tells them that a couple of times. One is because they can't take hold of it at one time. But secondly, they needed to grow into it. It was so big, they needed to grow up to be able to experience it fully. And in fact, that's kind of the, the bottom line of the series we started together last weekend that's simply titled, Small Steps to Big Dreams. Now, if you weren't here last Sunday, and I know some of you were still traveling, coming back from being away on the holidays, others of you were still recovering from New Year's Eve. So anyway, if you weren't here last Sunday or you weren't online, let me just kind of catch you up real quickly about this, this, this whole idea that you and I experience the big dreams of God for us in small steps. And the first thing we talked about, we talked about three steps you and I need to take to, to know and experience God's big dream. And the first one is simply look up. Because big dreams don't come from us, they come from God. They don't come from our imagination, they come from God's imagination, which is bigger and better than ours could ever be. Paul says that specifically in Ephesians 3, that God has things planned for us that are beyond anything you and I could imagine, think, dream up, even pray for. It is beyond anything we've ever comprehended or even thought about. God has amazing dreams and plans for us. Before you were born, God had a plan for your life. Before you were, God had a big dream for your life. And, and you and I can know it's God's dream and not our dream, because how do you know I'm not just dreaming myself? God's dream always, it bless us. God's dreams bless others, and God's dreams show him. They bless God. So while God's dreams involve us, they're about more than us. It's not just us. It's not just my success. It's how my success can bless others and how our successes in life show who God is. Then the second look, we look up. Then we look in. We don't start looking in. We look up. Then we look in because God has pre-packed us for our dream. See, God has already put into you. We talked about, Scripture says God has shaped us uniquely. You have a unique shape, not just physically. We talked about the five elements of that word shape, five aspects of your life and mine that are unique to you. There's never been one like you that never will be again. You are unique, and so is God's dream for your life. When you and I start unpacking our, 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 what we're passionate about and our abilities and our experiences, our personality, we start unpacking who we are, and you start realizing that's not an accident. God knew what he had planned for you before you were born, so he put into you what you would need to accomplish to go after that big dream. And much of what, I often will hear people say, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I say, look inside. What are you passionate about? What, 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 what gets you going? What, what are you ticked off about? Those are all clues 
That's the big dream. So we look in to discover the big dream God has. And then the third thing we talked about, we look up, we look in, and then we look at ants. That's what Solomon says in Proverbs 6, 6. He says, look at ants. Why? Because ants are little creatures that accomplish some big things just one step at a time. One grain of sand at a time. It is amazing what ants can accomplish. They're so little and their steps are so small, but they do so much because that's a key and a secret to accomplishing big things. To do them one little step at a time, one grain of sand at a time. We talked about that. What can you do just one step at a time? And, and that, was, that was last weekend. We're going to continue to talk about the, 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 the small steps we can take, but this time we're not going to talk about ant steps. We're going to talk about turtle steps. And the turtle wins. Why? We win. Why? Because of understanding the importance of slow and steady steps. I want to walk you through, I want to walk you through four just for a moment. And if you've got your phones or you've got your notes, you, you can download the notes. If you're watching online, you can download the notes and follow. And why do, why do I do that? Because once again, at least for me, I'm a visual learner. And often if I want to learn something, I write it down. When I write it, I can see it. It, it, just, it helps me to hear, to listen, to write. It helps me engage more of me in, in learning. So let me, give you, let me give you four things that we learn from the turtle who won, from Scripture. And, and here's the first one in your notes. The first one is this. Great wins don't happen without great starts. Okay, the word I want you to write is starts. The word I want you to think about is great starts. Starting has been called the great separator. And here's why. Starting is what separates the doers from the do-nots, the haves from the have-nots, the winners from the whiners. What separates the starting? In fact, here's how Scripture puts it. Watch. Zechariah 4, verse 10. God says, do not despise small, what? Beginnings. For the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Now don't miss that. God doesn't say, I rejoice when it's finished. I rejoice to see you complete it. No, he says, I rejoice to see you start. And, and great starts, and I use the word great, great starts aren't fast starts or even big starts. In fact, God specifically says, don't despise small starts. Don't despise small beginnings. See, great starts are small, slow starts. They're, 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 they're small beginnings. It is so important to understand. In fact, God calls them small beginnings. Stephen Geis, an author, he calls them, he calls them stupidly small steps. He's written a book. I recommended it to you last year. I, I reread the book for this series and be sharing some more stuff from it. It's a great book called Many Habits. And Stephen Geis says, if you, want to, if you really want to do something great, you've got to take a stupidly small step. Now, by stupidly small step, he's not saying the step is stupid. He's saying it's so small, it's doable. Anyone can do it. There's no reason you can't do it. Like one of the examples he gives in his book kind of to start it out, and, and we'll do it together as kind of an exercise. He challenges his readers. I challenge you, take your finger and just touch your nose, right? Like everyone in the online, touch your nose. Come on. All right. Those of you who did it, congratulations. Those of you who didn't, you'll have to try it later. And here's why I congratulate you. And here's why he says to do it. Like, it's like, you say, oh, it doesn't make any sense. It's no big deal. Exactly. It didn't take a lot of willpower or effort or training. You just had to do it. And here's what Stephen Geist writes. The genius of taking one stupidly small step is that it puts us in motion. And once you get your life in motion... Chances are good, probability is, you will stay in motion. See, that's really Newton's law of motion, and it actually has two parts. The first part is that an object that is at rest will stay at rest until external forces act upon it. Uh, a person in their lazy boy will stay in their lazy boy until their spouse says, I need something done. So, so until a force acts upon it, we stay at rest, a body at rest. 
But the second part of the law of motion says that an object that is in motion will not change its velocity or its speed unless an external force acts upon it. In other words, once you're moving, it takes an external force to stop you from moving because once you're in motion, there is a law of motion that takes place. So one of the keys for you and me to experience advancement in any area of life is to get in motion. And we get in motion by a start, by a simple, stupidly simple start. And what's really interesting is once you start, if you take a second step, you've got a winning streak. Okay, it's like two steps and you've got a winning streak going. And, and in his book, he challenges us. And I want to challenge you. And scripture challenges us to small beginnings. And I ask you, in, the, in the, the big dreams God has for you in the areas of your life, whether it's physically or financially or relationally or spiritually or in your calling, whatever big dream, and, and you have one because God made you with one and he put it in you. Sometimes we don't discover it, we don't ask for it, we don't look for it, but you have one. And some of you know what it is. My question is, what simple step are you taking to start? How are you start? You'll never reach the finish line if you don't leave the starting line. Listen, we need deadlines to start, not just deadlines to finish. We usually talk about deadlines, I gotta finish or I'm dead. You gotta start or you're dead. So are you start? Again, Stephen Geis talks about how he even got this whole concept, and it's, it's so full of, of psychological, physiological, all kinds of principles, was he was not in really very good physical shape. And so he decided, he got down on the floor and did one push-up. So he challenged, if you want to get in physical shape, before you go to bed tonight, just do one push-up. Just one. That's it. Just one. You're done. Now you'll say, well, this wasn't as hard as I thought. Just do one. Now, here's what will happen. Chances are, when you're on the floor doing one, you'll go for two. Okay? But stop there. Like, like don't, don't keep going. Don't do three or four or five or ten, because then you'll quit and you'll never start. So just, just do one or maybe two. But once you start your body in motion... It'll help you to start and to continue to be in motion. If you, wanna, if you wanna experience God in 2021 and know God like you never had before, I wanna challenge you to read before you go to bed tonight, before you go to sleep tonight, read two pages of the Bible, just two. Now I've often encouraged you and, and, and I personally read the message Bible for my like devotional Bible because it's written kind of in story form by Eugene Peterson translation. It's, it's, it's an excellent reading Bible called the Message, the Message Bible. On our Benita Valley app, we have various Bible translations. It's free. Uh, I have it on my phone. I have hard copies. I challenge you just to read two pages. That's it, two pages and stop. Some of you have tried to read the whole Bible. Oh, it's a big book. Just read two pages and stop. I also encourage you to start, don't start like in Leviticus or Revelation. Okay, like, like start, start with Mark. The, start with the Gospels, the, the, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark is the fastest paced of all the, all the Gospels. And just start in Mark. Just read two pages and stop. And now sometimes what's going to happen is the second, the, at the second page, it's, it's halfway through a sentence, so you want to finish, or halfway through a story, so you won't start. But, but just two pages, just, just two pages, and then stop. If you have some big dreams for your relationships this year, for your family, for your friendships. I challenge you before you go to sleep tonight, before you go to bed tonight, I challenge you to, to tell someone that you value them, that you love them, that you appreciate them, that you're sorry. Or last one to bed, turn out the lights. Okay, now that might not help your relationship, it'll save your utilities. But anyway, so I just encourage you to do, listen, I, before you go to bed tonight, why? Because tomorrow will be tomorrow, will be tomorrow, won't come. I, I encourage you to start now. Now, that's one of the reasons I love New Year's. I really do. I enjoy New Year's. I enjoy fresh calendars. Like, come on, let's get real. How many of you were not going to start a diet just before Thanksgiving? Like, no way. We're like, we're going to, and, and then, it's, then it's Christmas, you know, and then it's food, and then it's cookies, and then it's like, it's New Year's. But that's gone. It's a new year. So I challenge you, what simple, stupidly simple step toward the dream of God for your life toward the education, the relationship, the spiritual life, the ministry, what simple, stupidly simple step can you take? Because you'll never experience a great finish without a great start. And a great start isn't a big start, it's a small beginning. So just begin. Now, here's the second in your notes. 
Great wins, secondly, don't happen without great effort. The word I want you to write is effort. I want you to exert some effort and write effort, all right? And here's a principle of life, and I encourage you to remember this. The more effortless something looks, the more effort went into it. Now, let me say that again. The more effortless something appears to be, the more effortless something looks, the more effort there is behind it. The more effort went into it. Let me give you an example. Our musicians, our worship team, they, they, they do an amazing job every single week, and their talent is off the charts. But let me tell you something about Gabe, who, who directs all of our music and band, and, and our other musicians. We, have, we really have world-class musicians. They are. They've, they've played on albums. They've done amazing, amazing things. And they make what's hard look easy. Have you noticed that? Like, like, they're looking at us and they're playing. We're like, oh, I'd be looking right at it. They're looking at us. They're singing. They're doing, and they're playing, and it's, it's amazing. But let me tell you something. What looks so effortless isn't. Let me tell you the secret to how Gabe and the whole team can play the way they play because they have put effort into it, not for days or weeks or months, but years. When you see somebody who can play as they play or people that sing or do things or, or whatever you look at and you're like, wow, I'd like to do that, know that they make it look easy because they put in so much effort. Same thing is true of athletes. All right, let me show you a picture. Some of you will recognize this guy, Phil Mickelson. Uh, actually, from San Diego area, he's a pro golfer. I use this because golfing is God's sport. You play it on the Holy Land, there's like 18 holes. This is a, this is a God thing. So anyway, so, so Phil Mickelson, I was reading about when Phil was young, and his short game, that's, that's like, like chipping, his putting wasn't, wasn't that good. He's young, so his golf coach gave him a challenge. He gave him a challenge of making 100 three-foot putts consecutively. Just three feet away, and make it 100 times in a row. And so he, he, he took the challenge, and he got to 99 in a row, and he missed the 100th putt. Now, how many of you would go, close enough, let's round up? <laughs> and that's why you're sitting here, and he's on a PGA Tour. Because so, what happened was, it wasn't enough for Phil Mickelson, so he started over again. And it took him time, and it took him effort. He, he actually did. He started all over again. And it took him quite a while, but he eventually won the 100 in a row, 100 consecutive three-foot putt challenge. And because, because of just taking that challenge of, see, so a lot of people have talent, but they don't put effort with the talent, so they never reach the potential that they have. He's now won 44 golf tournaments. He's won five majors, which is like, you're like what's that? It's the really big golf tournament. It's like, there's a lot of tournaments. It's the biggest of the, of the big tournaments. Why? Because when you watch players, athletes, football, baseball, it doesn't matter what it is, soccer, when you watch athletes and they do things that look so effortless, know this, a lot of effort went into looking effortless. And the same thing is true for believers. The Apostle Paul, he did so much, but it was, he was an all-out effort guy. Let me show you. Watch this. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 25. Paul writes, All good athletes train hard. They do it for a gold medal that tarnishes and fades. You're after one that's gold eternally. I don't know about you, but I'm running hard for the finish line. I'm giving it everything I've God, no sloppy living for me. I'm staying alert and in top condition. He's not talking about athletes. He's talking about his life, our life. I'm not going to get caught napping, telling everyone else all about it, and then missing out on it myself. How many know a lot of people love to coach? They just can't play. Come on, how many of you had friends, and they didn't have kids, and they told you how to raise perfect kids? Just tell them, get in the game. Then you come back and tell me. It's one thing to tell others how to win. It's another thing to win. It's one thing to be a coach. It's another to be a player. And how do you win? You win by great effort. 
You wouldn't buy under, in fact, that's why scripture, it's amazing how many times the Bible tells us, it gives us this challenge, make every effort. Let me just show you. Watch. Romans 14, verse 19, make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Peace and building people up isn't easy. It takes effort. Ephesians 4, verse 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. It takes effort to stay united. So many things divide us. So many things divide us as a people, a nation. It takes effort to have unity. 2 Peter 3, verse 14, Peter writes, make every effort to live a pure and blameless life. Pure here doesn't mean sinless. It means focused, single-hearted, going after it. Blameless means standing right with God. It takes effort. We need to ask ourselves, how's my effort level? When it comes to the big wins in your life, how's your effort level? You'll get out of it what you put into it, so what are you putting into it? There are many of us who want a lot out of a lot of areas of our life, but the truth is we're not making the investment, and the investment, investment isn't talent, the investment isn't potential. The investment is effort. I heard another little phrase about life that just kind of certain things stick in my brain, and it was this little line that everything's difficult before it becomes easy. There's a lot of things in life that are so difficult the first time you do it. it, it, it it's so difficult to tie your shoes. That's why some of you wear slip-ons. It's so difficult to, to learn certain things. But once you finally learn them, I mean, the first handful of times your tongue's hanging out, you got to float. But after a while, if you put in the effort, what takes so much effort, it becomes effortless. Not because it doesn't take work, but because you've put in the work. Now, let me give you a, a third Here's a third to write down. Great wins don't happen without great consistency. Okay, third word I want you to write is the word consistency. It's not what we do once in a while that will change our life. It's not taking one step. It's not skipping one meal. It's not, it's not, it's not doing one push-up. That will get you started. Go team. But it's not doing one, it's what we consistently do. It's, 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 the Bible has a word for being consistently consistent. And the biblical word is faithfulness. Watch this. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 2, Paul writes, Now it is required that those who have been given a trust, and we all have, every one of us, a trust is a God-given calling and dream, must prove what? Okay, now, like when I say what, you answer with whatever the next word is. Okay, that's like how this works. Okay, so we're going to try this again because some of you don't seem to know that. So I'm going to say what, and you're going to answer. All right, it takes effort. Okay, Paul says it is required that those who have been given a trust, everything you have is a trust. Life is on loan. Your time, your talent, your money, your resource, everything you've got. You arrived in the world with nothing, you'll leave with nothing. Whatever you have is on loan from God. Those who've been given a loan from God, a trust from God, must prove what? Faithful. Ah, you're here. Faithful means consistent. They show up. They make an effort, not one time, but every time. They find themselves making Consistent efforts, constant efforts. Those who are consistently consistent, faithful in doing small things as if they're big things. See, that's the key. Well, I do the big things well. If you don't do the small things well, you don't do the big things well. I played sports all my life, and one of the phrases, coach, is you play like you practice. If you don't practice, you won't play. It won't all of a sudden show up. It'll show up because you do the small things as if they're big things. When no one's looking, when no one's applauding in ways that, that no one else appreciates, they don't know the hours you put in. I have so many stories of, of people that are so successful who put in and do things that no one would believe what they put in to do what they do. They went on levels and in ways that those who don't, don't. That's a business 
lesson that Jim Collins learned and he shares in his book, Great by Choice. Jim Collins is a, a business writer, researcher. He's written a number of books and, and I've read most of his books because again, they, they help people that manage anything, manage life. And, and he writes in his book, Great by Choice, about two teams of explorers that in 1911 raced to become the first human beings to reach the South Pole. Now, first of all, that is not one of my big dreams because it's cold at either pole, all right? Like, I'm done with cold, all right? So, like, I digress for just a moment, but have you ever watched on TV, have you ever watched those mountain climber, like, National Geographic? Have you ever seen, they like, climb these? I have never wanted to do that. And when I watch them, I'm always like, why? And I, you know, I've heard, it's because it was there. <laughs> yeah, the ocean's there, but I don't want to swim it. So, like, why? In fact, have you read? I, I've read that why, do you know why mountain climbers have ropes around their waist? You ever seen, they walk, they're all got ropes around. That's so that nobody leaves and goes home. Because <laughs> it's like, why am I here? Anyway, so I digress. So, so there, there's two teams. One is from Great Britain, led by Robert Falcon Scott. The other team's from Norway, led, led by Rual Amundsen. Each of them were racing for the honor of planting their country's flag at 90 degrees south, South Pole. The race was three months long. Arctic conditions, unbelievably challenging. Physically, psychologically, the teams battled freezing winds, frostbite, meager rations, total exhaustion as they crossed what seemed like endless expanse of white. Now, Jim writes that the British team, Scott's British team, they had a strategy of going as many miles as possible when the conditions were good, and then when the conditions were bad, they would just hunker down. And conditions were often bad. I mean, it was freezing winds, so they would just stop. So if the, if the day was halfway decent, they would go as far, they would, they would go to, they were totally exhausted. But if the conditions were like not favorable, they would just, they would just hunker down and wait till it got better. The Norwegian team, Amundsen's team, decided to do something different. He had a different strategy. And he had a strategy based that he had prepared for a for, for long, long time, months and months and months to get ready for this race. In fact, interestingly, I was reading about him. He had gone to, to like Alaska, and he'd gone up and lived with Eskimos for a while to watch how they moved and how they functioned in very cold places. So he came up with a strategy, and his strategy for his team, his Norwegian team, was they would do 20 miles a day no matter what. No matter what the weather, no matter what, if it was good weather, if it was bad weather, if it was horrendous weather, they were going 20 miles every single day. In fact, one of the days, it was, the weather was absolutely atrocious, and, and the, the British team just hunkered down, but the Norwegian team made it 13 miles on that day. They didn't make 20, but they made 13 on one of the worst days of the entire trip. Because they were, every single day, they were going to slow and steady. Sound like turtle, you know? Slow and steady. And so they did that. Now, interestingly, well, which team do you think won? Well, let me put it like this. When the British team got to the South Pole, they saw a Norwegian flag was already planted. The Norwegian team not only got there, they got back. And their entire team survived. They got back on the exact day that their team leader said that they would. They got back on the that day that Amundsen said they would. It was 1,860 miles they traveled in 99 days. And one of the things that's been studied and, and, and why Jim was sharing this in his book and study with businesses is, is it is not the hit or miss person that wins. It is the steady, slow person that every single day, steady, slow, steady, slow. See, people that are hit or miss, they have hit or miss lives. But people that are steady and slow and every single day win in ways that others never experience. So, so, so here's my question to you. Because it's, it's, it's been proven the difference between being steady, not just slow, but slow and steady. In fact, there are times you could go faster, but... but you're a not to. That's why I said you can do one push up and stop. C come on, how many of you want to get in shape in one day? Like, I've been in bed. Like, it took you your whole life to get out of shape. How are you going to get in shape in one day? I want to lose 30 pounds in one day. Crash, not crash, because we're so impatient. 
And I, I, as I said, I do a lot of reading, and, and, and one thing really convicted me. They've, they've done a study that goldfish have a longer attention span than humans. Goldfish can focus for eight seconds. <laughs> Not us. Like on computers, like if a page doesn't load with, like we, we're down to like three seconds with stuff. Our attention span is so short. Our addictedness to instant we want it now. If it takes now and the next, we're not in for it. If you want to win, you will be. God's big dream is bigger than any instant. It's, it's consistency. Here's my question. What are your consistent practices? What are your daily disciplines? What do you do every day, whether you feel like it or not, whether it's a good day or a bad day, what do you do every day when it comes to your spiritual goals? when it comes to your physical goals, when it comes to your relational goals, when it comes to your, your calling. And I want to tell you honestly, while I was working on this message, and I've been reading for weeks and weeks and reading a lot of stuff, and, and what, this week while I'm writing this, and I'm writing about being consistently consistent and about being faithful and about doing it every single day. And, and I run three days a week. That's my goal, three days a week. And I, like, like I, I work out like four days a week and it's like, like just to stay alive. And, and it's kind of a stress reducer for me and there's a lot of reasons for it. But, but, but I'm writing about being consistent and it's my running day and I didn't feel like running. Like my shoes are there going, let's go. I'm like, no, let's not. Because I leave out triggers for things. Like they just like remind me of stuff. Like, I need to drink water, so I leave a bottle of water there to remember, and I go, hey, there it is. I don't want to. So, I, so but while I'm, while I'm having this battle inside, I thought, hey, how can I tell them, do it? And I, so I ran. I did. I ran. Now, my wife has asked me on a few occasions, do you ever get that runner's high? I get runner's high when I quit. Okay? <laughs> like, I really don't get it while I'm running. Like, I play music, and I do other stuff, but... but I, I, often I'll run like the golf course, and, and when, I'm on the, when, I, when I see the church again, I'm, I'm, I'm getting happier because that's when I'm going to stop. But I want to tell you something about your daily disciplines. They cannot be based on feelings. Even motivation, and, and I'll, I'll do something later on motivation. Motivation is a really interesting deal. Many times motivation is feeling. I feel like I'm motivated to do it. Don't let your motivation be based on feelings. Your motivation must be based on values. See, if I base my motivation on a value that doesn't change, then I'm going to always have motivation. But if I base my motivation on feelings, they're, they're changing all the time. Come on, my motivations change based on my blood sugar levels, based on like, how much sleep I got, based on some conversation with somebody. Feelings go all over the place. So if you wait till you feel like doing something to do it, you're going to be a hit or miss, and you're going to miss more than you hit. But if you'll base your disciplines on values, if you'll base your disciplines on values, if you'll base your consistency on values, you'll find yourself being so much more consistent, so much more a part of what God has for you, which is what winners do. And then let me give you one more. Okay, one more I want you to write down. Great wins don't happen without great stick to itiveness. Yep, that's a word. You can look it up, it's in the dictionary. Stick to itiveness. That's sticking to it. Now, there's a, that, that word doesn't get used a lot because it, it's not easy to say, it takes a long time to write. But it's why more people don't win at the big dreams and plans of life that God has for us. You know the, the old saying, when the going gets tough, most people quit. Now, I know the saying, the tough get going, but there's not a lot of tough people that keep going. Most people give up. There's a biblical word for stick to and here it is. It's perseverance. It's another, like, archaic word that's not thrown around a lot, but Scripture uses it. Watch. 2 Peter 1, verse 5 and 6, Peter writes, make every effort to add to your faith, what? Perseverance. perseverance. Good. The Greek word perseverance, and it's used a lot of times in a lot of places, but for the most part, it was a military word that meant to courageously hold your position, to hang tough, to finish the mission. 
And that's when Paul writes in, in, in Ephesians about putting on the whole armor of God and, and you can take your stand in the day of battle. And then he says, having done all to stand, stand, persevere. Make up your mind, I shall not be moved. I'm going to finish this thing. Make up your mind that you're going to be a finisher. Make up your mind before you start that you're going to finish. Don't let the situation dictate whether you finish or not. You decide before you ever leave the starting line that I'm going to cross the finish line. Let that be a core value of your life. And what's interesting to me is that when Peter writes this, make every effort to add to your faith perseverance, he has written in this passage several things to add to our faith. He says, God has given you everything you need for life and godliness, therefore make every effort. You know, that doesn't make sense. No, he's saying God has given you all that you need, now put it together. Uh, have any of you seen the advertisements? There's places where you can order these meals, and, and it all comes in a box, but then you've got to cook it. I worked for a guy one summer when I was in high school, and then when I was in college, my home church, and he built these prefab houses. And trucks would come and dump off. All the lumber was pre-cut. All, everything was pre-done, but you had to build it. They would dump it at the site. And, and in fact, one of my jobs, the first year I worked for him, I was just a night watchman because I didn't know how to build. I just watched stuff as good as I could. God has given you everything you need, but he says you make every effort to, to put it together, to use it, to utilize it, to make the most of it. And what I find interesting is right in the middle of what he says to make every effort to do, he puts the word persevere. Why? Because you often want to quit in the middle of anything. It's often in the middle that we want to quit. Uh, interestingly, when they were building the wall, Nehemiah's story, it was the halfway point that people lost heart. It's often when you lose heart. At the halfway point of anything, halfway point of college, education, it doesn't matter, halfway points, you're no longer excited about the starting line and you can't see the finish line. And so you start going, why? There's always that why moment. I was walking with a good friend of mine just, just recently. We're walking and his son calls him on the phone from another state and his son is in college, but he's doing a part-time job and he liked his job better than what he's going to school for, so he wanted to quit college. And I'm hearing this conversation because you can hear it as you talk. And then afterwards, my friend and I, were, I said, my son Jordan had the same desire. I remember when Jordan was at school and you go a couple of years, you're like, I, I got to get out. I got I And I remember having the conversation and just encouraging, just finish. It's not necessarily that four years are going to make you or break you, but finishing will make you or break you. It's just so important to learn to be a finisher with things. Now, I'm not telling you finish everything. Some things aren't worth finishing. You shouldn't have got into it in the first place. But, but if it's a God thing, if it's got value, if it's got meaning, if it's got purpose, then finish it. Because people that stick to it win in ways that those who don't, don't. And that's why Scripture encourages us so many times not to quit until you cross the finish line. Let me, let me show you, let me show, show you a, a few Galatians 6, verse 9. So let us not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if, say this out loud, we don't give up. Luke 18, verse 1, Jesus told his disciples a story about how they should keep on praying, say it out loud, and never give up. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8. Paul writes, we often suffer. There's suffering in life, in the believer's life, but we are never crushed. Even when we don't know what to do, and I have been there, saying out loud, we never give up. Hebrews 12, verse 1, since we're surrounded by so many examples of faith, we must get rid of everything that slows us down, especially sin that distracts us. We must run the race that lies ahead of us, say it out loud, and never give up. And one more, Isaiah 50, verse 7. I refuse to give up because I know that God will, say it out loud, never let me down. Listen, never give up on God or his dream for your life because God will never give up on you or his dream for your life. I tell you that out of Scripture. The Bible says that God's callings are without repentance. That means he doesn't change his mind. That means when God dreamed you, he dreamed your dream before you started. He never changed his mind about the dream or you. So don't change your mind about God. Don't give up on God. 
Don't give up on the dream God gave you for your marriage, for your family, for your finances, for your education, for your career, for your calling, for your ministry. It is so easy to bail. We are, we are, are people that bail in ways. We bail. If, if it's tough, if it's difficult, if, it is, if it's not instant, I'm out of here. Not if you're going to. Not if you're going to experience a win that's bigger than any single moment. A win that's going to take you all the way into eternity. In fact, here's a line from a writer that I found really, really encouraging. I will put it on the screen. It simply says this. Miracles happen at the place where our grit meets God's grace. In fact, I want, you to, I want you to read that out loud with me because it'll stick out loud together. Miracles happen at the place where our grit meets God's grace. God promises grace. We got to bring the grit. We got to bring, I will stick to it. If you call me, I will finish. And when you make a commitment to bring the grit, God will bring the grace and miracles will happen. Solomon, wisest man who ever lived, made an interesting observation. He said this in Ecclesiastes, the race doesn't always go to the swift. The fastest doesn't always when there's a turtle that agrees with that it was not the fast turtle it was the slow and steady turtle who beat the fast rabbit because life and dreams are not a sprint they're a marathon and you and I will win it if we'll do if we'll do what the turtle did, if we'll learn some turtle steps. The first one is great wins don't happen without great starts. You'll never cross the finish line as a winner if you don't leave the starting line. So my challenge to you once again is, are you starting? And you start now, you start today, you start where you are. Don't start tomorrow. I was telling some folks after the first service, I read about this gas station guy, he put a sign in front of his store that says, Gas, half price, tomorrow. People kept showing up every day, but it wasn't tomorrow. Okay, <laughs> some of you get that. And then they booed him. And, so, anyway, so don't start tomorrow. That's why I challenged you earlier to start what you're doing today, to do one push-up today, to, do, to read two pages of the Bible today. Whatever you're going to do, start it today. The second lesson is great wins require great effort. You'll never experience great wins without great effort. What that means, again, is whenever you see something that is effortless, know this, a lot of effort went into that. Whenever you see somebody and it looks effortless, it's because they put effort into it. So my question to you is, are you an all-out person or a half-hearted person? Now, I get all kinds of journals and things they send to pastors, and one of the things that I saw, and some of it is, is encouraging, some of it's discouraging. One is that the average churchgoer attends church, if they attend church, they attend church like twice, two times out of a month. Two times out of four, two times out of five. So it's like show up, miss, show up, miss, 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 show up, miss, miss. And then there's those who show up Christmas and Easter and then miss, 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 miss. Oh. And let me just tell you that if you are a hit and miss person with, not this church, with God, you're gonna be a hit and miss person with God's dreams in your life. There's something about you and I not only giving it our best effort, but the, the third is to be consistently consistent. That we give our effort and then we're consistent in what we do. And the biblical word is faithful. To the one who's been given a trust by God, a dream by God, they must prove faithful. I challenge you, how faithful are you in your marriage, in your finances, with your family, with your friends, with your calling? Faithfulness isn't flashy. Sometimes it's not exciting, but it's what winners do. And then the last is simply great stick because we just don't give up. We persevere. We're not stopping until we cross the finish line. 
I honestly, in my heart and life, want to be able to say what Paul said at the end of his life. It's an amazing declaration. Paul writes, I have finished the race. Wow. To be able to say, I have finished what God called me to do. And I want to challenge you. I want to challenge me to experience the big dream God has for us in small steps, in turtle-like steps that are slow and steady. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would take this second message as we talk about how we experience the big dreams you have for us. And Holy Spirit, I pray you would apply it to each of us in our own unique settings, situations. It's amazing how you could take one word and you just bring it home to our hearts. I pray for that person, Lord, today who hasn't started yet, just to get going. For that person, Lord, who's just not making the effort. For the person, Lord, who's just wondering, can I keep doing this for their marriage, their family? I pray for each and every one that they would stick to and persevere until they cross the line. The way you start the race, if you've never asked Jesus into your life, that's how you start. Right where you sit, those of you online can simply pray, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Thank you for dying for me on the cross. You paid a price that I cannot pay. You covered me. You put me in the race by the entry fee you paid. Now I will run and I will follow you with my whole heart. It just starts right there. I'm going to ask all of us in this room, would you stand with me just for a moment? Would you stand, please? That's one simple step I ask you to take. Just stand. Now, I didn't say walk out. I just said stand. Okay, so we're just starting. I want to have just a quick word with you. We're going to finish together. It's, I'm, I'm so delighted to see you. I really am. For some of our family of faith, it's like been almost a year since we've seen each other, and, and I hope each and every one is doing well. We're praying for each and every one. As Pastor Mike mentioned earlier, we're praying for Isaac, especially Isaac Cadrillo, who, who's our media director, his wife, Beth. Um, years ago, she'd had a liver, liver transplant, and, and she's had some, some pneumonia. She's been in the hospital. She's been in ICU, and it's, she's in very critical condition. I, pneumonia and, and COVID, and, and I got a text. I, I was in contact with Isaac just before the first service to find out how she was doing, and they didn't think she was going to make it through the night, and they called the family, but she made it through the night. So she's a fighter. But let's, we want to pray for them and pray with them. And they're not the only one. There's so many stories in our family of faith, the people that you know and love. So I just encourage you to, to fight the fight for others in prayer and faith and in, in, in intercession. And we're going to experience in 2021, how many are ready to experience God's biggest, best dreams for your life? I am. Father, bless your people and make them a blessing. And help us to be not only hearers of your word, but doers. And again, I echo Pastor Mike's prayer for Beth and Isaac and their whole family and so many others, Lord, who are just going through some major, major battles and challenges. Thank you that where our grit and your grace meet, miracles happen. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Have a great week. Dream big. God bless. See you next weekend, next Sunday. God bless.